Hey everyone. So we're at our uh, StreamYard event. This is for our uh, gallery coming up at the uh, Northland Community Technical College in Thief River Falls. The gallery theme is Elemental, Earth, Air, Fire, Water, and Space. And so this is um, with the Northwest Minnesota Arts Council. And so we're reaching out to uh, anyone that would be interested in submitting uh, poetry or written work or illustration. Uh, that revolves around the theme elemental. And to help you out with this, we've invited uh, writer and poet Dale Jacobson uh, to join us. This will be our third uh, series uh, uh, out of three. And so Dale is talking about uh, this theme elemental, how to uh, use it with writing and poetry, different ideas, uh, he gives different examples. And so I, if you haven't seen the first two episodes, I encourage you to go back and check those out. And uh, I hope you enjoy this one. And so now I'm just going to turn it over to Dale. Hello, everyone. Again, it's good to see you. Um, I was just looking for something here. I um, want to talk a little bit about taking things beyond uh, the experience into what we might consider a philosophical discussion with it, or argument within a poem. And uh, I, I, the, again, we, we do that in the similar way that we uh, make a abstract concept uh, concrete through example and so on. But sometimes it, it, the language itself becomes a, a little philosophical and it can still work. So I, I don't want to leave the impression that abstraction or conceptual language is anathema to poetry because it isn't. It's just we, we want to make it presented in such a way that the reader can connect with what we want to communicate. So sometimes we can do that um, in a different way. And I wanted to read a part of Carl Sandburg's poem. Uh, I think I, to my way of seeing it would be classified as visionary. And that's, that's a difficult word to use because you know, whatever it means, we're into this abstract thing that I'm talking about a lot. Um, but I think we, I'll just read the poem and then we can talk about it a little bit. He, he begins using an argument and, and you can see where his argument is, I think, very, quite effective starts out with some statements that no doubt the world once spoke, which are now no longer true. For example, he says, man will never write, they said before the alphabet came, and man at last began to write. Man will never fly, they said before the planes and blimps zoomed and purred in arcs, winding their circles around the globe. Man will never make the United States of Europe, nor later yet the United States of the world. No, you are going too far when you talk about one world flag for the great family of nations. They say that now. What he's talking about isn't American hegemony when he says the United States of Europe. He's talking about the expansion of what he perceived as democracy worldwide. 
So, no, you are going too far when you talk about one world flag for the great family of nations. They say that now. But they said the same thing about writing. They said the same thing about man will never fly. And yet those things happened. Uh, I'm breaking this uh, into a commentary a little bit, but it's always fascinated me, for example, to think of physics and biology. In the early stages of the universe, there was no one who could have predicted life because it didn't exist. It would have seemed biology didn't even, wasn't even in the la in, on the horizon anywhere, probably. It was just fire and physics. And yet here we are trying to understand our own consciousness. Well, the poem continues. And man the stumbler and finder goes on, man the dreamer of deep dreams, man the shaper and maker, man the answerer. The first wheel maker saw a wheel, carried it in his head, a wheel, and one day found his hands shaping a wheel, the first wheel. The first wagon maker saw a wagon join their hands and out of air, out of what had lived in their minds, made the first wagon. One by one, man alone and man joined has made things with his hands, beginning in the fog wisp of the dim imagining, resulting in a tool, a plan, a working model. Bones joined to breath, being alive, in wheels within wheels, ignition, power, transmission, reciprocals, beyond man alone, alive only with man joined, where to, what next? Man the tool maker, tool user, son of the burning quests, fixed with roaming forearms, hands attached to the forearms, fingers put on those hands, a thumb to face any finger, hand cunning with knife, leather, wood, hands for twisting, weaving, shaping, man the flint grinder, iron and bronze welder, smoothing mud into hot walls, smoothing reinforced concrete into bridges, breakwaters, office buildings, two hands projected into vast claws, giant hammers, into diggers, haulers, lifters, clamps of the big sho steam shovel, man's two hands, the motor hurling man into high air, man's two hands, the screws of his skull head joining the screws of his hands, pink convolutions transmitting to white knuckles, waves, signals, buttons, sparks, man with two hands for loving and strangling, man with the open palm of living handshakes, man with closed nails of the fist of combat, these hands of man where to, what next? And so notice how he focuses, the metaphor revolves around hands continually doing different things in very specific ways. And uh, some of it is quite elemental. Um, bath claws, giant hammers, diggers, haulers, lifters, these are the tools with which we communicate with the elements. Uh, he even talks about mud, smoothing mud into hot walls and so on. Poem continues, the people will live on. The learning and blundering people will live on. They will be tricked and sold and again sold and go back to the nurturing earth for rootholds. The people so peculiar in renewal and comeback you can't laugh off their capacity to take it. The mammoth rests between his cyclonic dramas. The people so often sleepy, weary, enigmatic in a vast huddle with many units saying, I earn my living. 
I make enough to get by, and it takes me all my time. If I had more time, I could do more for myself and maybe for others. I could read and study and talk things over and find out about things. It takes time. I wish I had time. The people is a tragic and comic two-face, hero and hoodlum, phantom and gorilla twisting to moan with a gargoyle mouth. They buy me and sell me. It's a game. Sometime I'll break loose. Once having marched, and, and here's where I think this poem becomes visionary in my sense of it, it widens out. Once having marched over the margins of animal necessity, over the grim line of sheer subsistence, then man came to the deeper rituals of his bones, to the lights lighter than any bones, to the time for thinking things over, to the dance, the song, the story, or the hours given over to dreaming once having so marched. Between the finite limitations of the five senses and the endless yearnings of man for the beyond, the people hold to the humdrum bidding of work and food while reaching out when it comes their way for lights beyond the prism of the five senses, for keepsakes lasting beyond any hunger of death. This reaching is alive. The panders and liars have violated and smutted it, yet this reaching is alive yet for lights and keepsakes. Well, that is somewhat abstract, but we come back to something very specific here. The people know the salt of the sea and the strength of the winds lashing the corners of the earth. The people take the earth as a tomb of rest and a cradle of hope. Who else speaks for the family of man? That should maybe be family of humans. They are in tune and step with constellations of universal law. The people is a polychrome, a spectrum and a prism held in a moving monolith, a console organ of changing themes a clavelox of color poems within the sea offers, wherein the sea offers fog and the fog moves off in rain and the Labrador sunset shortens to a nocturne of clear stars serene over the shot spray of northern lights. The steel mill is alive. This fire breaks white and zigzag shot of a gun metal gloaming. Man is a long time coming. Man will yet win. Brother may yet line up with brother. The oh, I love this line. The old, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this old anvil laughs at many broken hammers. There are men who can't be bought. The fireborn are at home in fire. The stars make no noise. You can't hinder the wind from blowing. Time is the great teacher who can live without hope. In the darkness, with a great bundle of grief, the people march. In the night and overhead, a shovel of stars for keeps the people march. Where to, what next? So I love the way he um, shifts between very specific things and very large statements. So that's the, the last thing I wanted to sort of touch on here is that a poetry that begins in very elemental concrete ways can expand outward. And, and maybe that's what we're getting to when we talk about the four elements and then space. What is the meaning of that word? to you, how does space convert into something that becomes life out of the four elements that precede it? So, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to prompt people into the possibilities here. 
and there's endless suggestions that can be made, but um, maybe some of this might uh, spark something. I hope so. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.